of it now being recorded. A uh, very good evening, good morning. So today we'll be discussing on the theme of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. So this is a very pertinent theme uh, because we know that worldwide there is a lot of pollution happening. This is our national capital, which has an image of being embedded in fog. And you know, the COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, are caused by cigarette smoking. But there is also an, another important entity in it, uh, that is asthma. And that can be virtually triggered by anything, like allergens. So what is COPD? They are a group of pathological conditions in which there is chronic, partial, or complete obstruction to the airflow at any level from the trachea here to the smallest airway, resulting in functional disability of the lungs. That is, there are diffuse lung diseases involving the entire lung. So the first two common are chronic bronchitis and emphysema, which are linked with cigarette smoking. And then we have bronchial asthma and bronchiectasis. We shall look at all of them. What is chronic bronchitis? It is defined clinically as persistent cough with expectoration on most days for at least three months of the year for two or more consecutive years. The cough is caused by over secretion of mucus. So there is a mucosal hyperplasia seen in smokers by definition at least three months of the year for two or more consecutive years, more commonly affecting males than females because yeah, definitely males have a more habit of smoking. So the risk factor is we always hear smoking quit smoking. Why? What does the smoking do? Smoking impairs the ciliary movement. It inhibits the function of alveolar macrophages, leading to hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the mucus secretoring glands. This can cause considerable obstruction of the small airways. It can stimulate the vagus nerve and cause bronchoconstriction. The other etiopathogenic factors are atmospheric pollution. That is, you know, the high levels of toxic fumes in the atmosphere, occupational hazards, such as those people working in cotton mills, plastic factories, and infections, bacterial, viral, mycoplasmal infections. They do not initiate, but they usually occur secondary to the bronchitis. What are the bron morphological features? So the bronchial wall is thickened, hyperemic means more of blood flow congested, edematous. The lumen of the bronchi and bronchioles may contain mucus plugs. Microscopically, what you find, you find hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Hypertrophy is increase in the size of cells. Hyperplasia increase in the number of cells of the cartilage. So you have the bronchial epithelium showing squamous metaplasia and sometimes it may go for dysplasia with a little chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate and non-cartilage component having goblet cell hyperplasia and intraluminal peribronchial fibrosis. So this is the comparison of a normal bronchus to a bronchus in chronic bronchitis. What is happening here is mucosal glands have increased, goblet cells have increased, right? So the read index, if you see the read index is from the cartilage to the smooth muscle and B is from the cartilage to the mucosal element. What has happened here, if we say the read index has increased, that means there is the subepithelium hyperplasia has happened because of the mucus glands, right? So we say there is an increase in the read index, right? Let's go back and see that. Yeah, because of the hyperplasia, right? The read index is increased. All right. So this element, if you see, that B to A is from the cartilage to the smoothnesses. B is from the cartilage to the epithelium. What has happened here? This was the ratio earlier. Now what you're finding is that which element has increased now? The read index, you see, if it is increased, B has increased more compared to A, correct? So B has increased more here compared to A, that is the called the read index. 
I hope that is clear, right? There is goblet cell hypoplasia as well, but there is mucosal gland hypoplasia as well. What are the clinical features? There is persistent cough with copious expectoration of long duration. It's called the morning catarrh, throat clearing, which worsens in winter, also called the smoker's cough. There is recurrent respiratory tract infection. Dyspnea is generally not prominent at rest, but is more on exertion. Patients are called blue bloaters because there is sinusis. The oxygenation capacity of the blood is reduced, so they're called blue bloaters. There can be progressive edema because of core pulmonary or the right heart failure. And chest x ray shows enlarged heart or prominent vessels. So, the, to summarize chronic bronchitis, there is mucosal gland hypoplasia. There is also increase in the, uh, the goblet cells. They have cough with expectoration. And because of sinuses, they're called the blue bloaters. Common complication is core pulmonary. Next, we come to the other entity called emphysema. Emphysema is permanent dilatation of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchiole with destruction of the walls of the dilated air spaces. So again, it's a continuum. Patients of chronic bronchitis progress to emphysema. Emphysema is again linked to smoking. And how? The so smoking causes inhibition of alpha-1 antitrypsin that inhibits antiprotease and leads to elastic damage. Again, it causes inflammatory cell recruitment, extracellular matrix degradation, increase in the protease, which causes elastic damage leading to emphysema. So there are two types of emphysema, true emphysema and compensative overinflation. True emphysema is of centri asena type, centri lobular emphysema, pan asena or fan lobular emphysema, paraseptal distal asena emphysema, irregular or parasympatrical emphysema, mixed or unclassified emphysema. Then you also have the compensatory emphysemas, senile hyperinflation due to aging lung, obstructive overinflation like infantile lobar emphysema, unilateral emphysema, and surgical emphysema. Grossly, the lungs are voluminous, pale with little blood. The edges of the lungs are round. There is dilatation of air spaces visible with the hand lens. Advanced cases show subpleural pleurae and blebs bulging outward from the surface of the lung with rib markings between. So subpleural bullae are there. What are bullae? Bullae are air-filled cyst-like spaces larger than one centimeter diameter formed by rupture of the adjacent air spaces. And if they rupture this bullae, if they rupture into the pleura, it can lead to spontaneous pneumothorax. You can see here, right? The bullae here, and they can lead to spontaneous pneumothorax. Microscopically, there is dilatation of the air spaces, destruction of the septal walls, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs. And features of chronic bronchitis may also be present. Bullae and blebs when present show fibrosis and chronic inflammation of the walls. So there is long history of increasing severe exertional dyspnea. It's not overnight. It's a long-standing history. Patient is quite distressed with the obvious use of accessory muscles or respiration. Chest is barrel-shaped, hyperresonant. Cough occurs late after dyspnea starts and is associated with scanty mucoid sputum. So recurrent respiratory infections are common. Patients are called pink puffers as they remain well oxygenated and have tachypnea, right? And weight loss is common. Features of right heart failure can occur, core pulmonary, and hypercapnic respiratory failure are the usual terminal events. Chest X-ray shows a small heart with hyperinflated lungs. So we have the center center central lobular emphysema here, the first type in which there is a central or proximal part of the SNS is involved, usually coexists with chronic bronchitis, and occurs predominantly in smokers and in cold worker minus pneumoconiosis. Grossly, upper loops of the lungs are involved, which is very characteristic. Coming to pan asana, pan lobular emphysema, in contrast to central asana, the pan asana involves the lower zones of the lung more frequently and more severely than the upper zones. So entire SNS is involved. That's why it's called pan asana. So this is the terminal bronchiole, terminal bronchiole with the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar ducts. Central SNR is the central part involvement, pan SNR, the pan alveolar, entire, all the SNI are involved. Look at this, the alveolus with the spurs of the broken septa here. Again, another one here, right? Individual alveoli are not there. They have all coalesced together and the septa are broken because of the action of the proteases. Then you also have a distal 
or a paraseptal acinar emphysema, distal part of the SNS is involved with the proximal part is normal, localized along the pleura and perilobular septae with areas of fibrosis and atelectasis. But also the subpleural portion of the lung shows air-filled spaces, 0 0.5 to 2 centimeter diameter. You can also have irregular or paraseptal emphysema, most common form seen in surrounding scars of any cause. It's irregular as regards the portion of the SNS involved. So the morphology of types of overinflation, like compensatory overinflation, you can have in part of the lung or a lobe is surgically removed. The residual lung undergoes a compensatory hyperinflation to fill the pleural cavity. Senile hyperinflation can occur in old people. The lungs become voluminous due to loss of elastic tissue, thinning and atrophy of the alveolar ducts and alveoli, obstructive overinflation, infantile lobar emphysema, partial obstruction of the bronchial tree by a tumor of a foreign body can cause overinflation of the region supplied by the obstructive bronchus called, in example, the infantile lobar emphysema. Unilateral emphysema can be seen when there is a history of serious pulmonary infection in the childhood, like bronchiolitis obliterans. Then you have interstitial emphysema or surgical emphysema, entry of air into the connective tissue framework of the lung, which can be caused by trauma to the ribs, right? And through surgical incisions, rupture of the esophagus, sudden change in atmospheric pressure, decompression sickness. In children, it can be seen whooping cough, bronchitis. So we have now covered the first part. When we say COPD, generally people say yeah, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, but yes. Under the same category, we also have bronchial asthma. Asthma is again, yeah, it is hyper responsiveness of the tracheobronchial tree to variety of stimuli, resulting in narrowing of the air passages, which may be relieved spontaneously or by therapy. Asthma is episodic disease manifested clinically by paroxysms of dyspnea, cough, and wheezing. So we have extrinsic and intrinsic asthmas. Extrinsic is common in childhood with rhinitis, urticaria, eczema present to the dust and pollens and allergens with elevated IgE levels, right? Whereas intrinsic is seen in adults, not really having the allergens or no family history. And drug hypersensitivity is to be present to aspirin associated with chronic bronchitis, nasal polyps, emphysema is common. Right? So grossly, if you were to see the lungs, they become over distended due to overinflation. There is occlusion of the bronchi and bronchi by visiting mucus plugs. And what you find in microscopy are Kirschman spirals, very important, charcot laden crystals, which are eosinophilic and diamond shaped crystals derived from eosinophils. The bronchial wall shows thickened, thickened basement membrane. And there is hypertrophy of the submucosal glands of the bronchial smooth muscles. There are episodes of acute exacerbation interspersed within the symptom free periods, and patient will have paroxysms of dyspnea, cough, and wheezing. And sometimes very serious and life threatening condition called status asthmaticus can also occur. This is very common the images of Kirschman spiral here with the neutrophils, a lot of eosinophils, and charcot laden crystals. This can be seen in a bronchial lavage, it can be seen in a bronchial cast plug on microscopy. Coming to another entity called bronchiectasis, it's abnormal and irreversible dilatation of the bronchi and bronchioles greater than 2 millimeters in diameter, developing secondary to inflammatory weakening of the bronchial walls. The most characteristic clinical manifestation of bronchiectasis is persistent cough with expectoration of copious amounts of foul-smelling purulent sputum. And the bronchial epithelium will be normal, ulcerated, or may show squamous metaplasia. And there will be infiltration by acute and chronic inflammatory cells, destruction of the normal muscle and elastic tissue with fibrosis. Interstitial pneumonial changes will be there in the surrounding lung tissue. And the pleura in the affected area is adherent and shows bands of fibrous tissue between the bronchus. We have the honeycomb lung here. This is the gross appearance of honeycomb lung and bronchiectasis. Dilated, permanent destruction of the bronchi. What are the morphological forms of bronchiectasis? They can be called as saccular, cylindrical, or varicose, based on the morphology. What you find in the microscopy is sloughed mucosa, distal bronchial with the mucus plugs. Clinical manifested bronchiectasis typically consists of chronic cough with foul smelling sputum, hemoptysis, recurrent pneumonia, and sinusitis can be seen. Patient can be clinically bronchiectasis patient develop clubbing. And 
they can be brain abscess, amyloidosis, complication, core pulmonitis, all those are associated. See, there's not one disease, it's a spectrum of diseases. And the, the morphology can extend in a different manner in a particular case. For example, a TB case can show you metastasis, can show you pleural effusion, right? So that's called the microbiological diagnosis. What we're talking about the morphological findings. How do you diagnose? You can use a X-ray flame, a P or AP view, a lateral or lateral decubitus, ultrasound, CT, MRI. And the diagnosis of COPD is based on the patient's symptoms, medical history, the results of spirometry test. A spirometry test tells the, how well a patient can breathe. And a person with COPD will have reduced post expiratory volume in one second and a reduced FEV1 by FVC ratio. So go for a spirometry. Any common people are seeing this uh, webinar? Yeah. How do you diagnose COPD is by going for a spirometry and clinical symptoms, most important. This is a spirometry test in a PFT laboratory, a pulmonary function test laboratory. The patient will drip, breathe, and blow into the tube, putting a clip on the nose, right? Treatment. So it may not be an exact cure, but yeah, the mainstay of treatment is quitting smoking for smokers using bronchodilators, inhaled cockatiss corticosteroids. Exercise and education play a lot of role in improving the quality of life. And how to prevent it? Avoid smoke exposure, quit smoking, avoid exposure to noxious particles and gases, get a regular exercise, eat a healthy diet. Summary, COPD is a serious disease, but is preventable and treatable. Chronic bronchitis, emphysema, bronchial asthma, and bronchitis are common forms of COPD. With the proper treatment, anyone can have a long and fulfilling life with COPD. These are my references. I must acknowledge the textbooks, right? The standard textbook I refer to and Google AI also, right? All right. Thank you. Thank you for the patient hearing.